So welcome. Thanks for being here in this uh, virtual session. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Switzerland. I live on uh, Lake Neuchâtel. It's dark outside now. The full moon is about to rise. Um, too bad we can't, you know, see each other and interact better than this, but that's that's what we can do and we'll do our best. So this talk is about uh, GraphQL in Apache Sling and the relationship to REST uh, because GraphQL is often uh, described as the opposite of REST, and I don't really agree with that. Uh, so we'll see that. It's um, it's a bit specific to Apache Sling, but I'll try to make it uh, you know as general as possible and, and not go into Sling details. Uh, consider Sling as our support for explaining these things and uh, and how they work. Uh, so my name is Bertrand de la Creta. I live, as I said, in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. I work for Adobe, attached to the uh, Basel office as a principal scientist, which is kind of an internal consultant. In on architecture topics and uh, coaching and uh, you know creating prototypes, I consider myself a hands-on architect. So I do my way of communicating architecture is usually through prototypes and, and demos. Uh, I'm also uh, quite active in the Apache Software Foundation. <clears throat> uh, currently on the board of directors on my 11th term, so very much interested in community topics as well. But this is a, a technical talk. Um, so first, uh, a few words on what is Apache Sling for those to make sure, you know, everybody has the context of what we are we're talking about. Uh, so basically, Sling is a, is a Java-based uh, web applications framework, another one of those. There's way, <laughs> there's lots of them, I would say. Uh, and so let me focus just on, on what's very specific in Sling. So it's, it's based on OSGI, which is very cool. Uh, sometimes people don't like OSGI. Uh, we started from scratch with OSGI and it's been uh, extremely successful, I would say. The, the module system is very nice. But, but what I wanted to explain here is how Sling processes HTTP requests. I think it's, that's uh, one of its uh, highlights. So we have a request coming in on uh, step one. Sling has a, uses a content repository based on the JCR API, the Java Content Repository API, JSR 283. And then the resource resolver component looks for a resource that matches the incoming URL. So the, it, it's mostly a one-to-one -one mapping. So you know from the, from the part of URL what you're going to be uh, addressing. And then this resource has a resource type. It's a property, just a string, uh, usually a string that looks like a path. And this points to the script or servlet that you're going to use to process the request, depending on the on the HTTP method that's used, on the extension of the request, and on the selectors, which are, you know, uh, as if you had multiple extensions in a servlet. And the, only the last one is the actual extension. The other ones are considered selectors. And these scripts are selected just by being there in the right place. So it's, you know, convention over configuration. It's very flexible. And then the, the scripting is executed to render the output. So I don't want to go into details, but we'll see a bit of that in, in how, how that, uh, you know, in how the, this module works. So a few words also introduction on GraphQL. I don't want to go into detail. You, you know, you'll find better introductions and more detail, but just to make sure everybody's on the same page, a very quick uh, overview of, of GraphQL, focusing only on the GraphQL queries. GraphQL also does mutations and uh, subscriptions, but we, for this example, we're only interested in the queries. So on the left, you see how a GraphQL query looks. Uh, and the, the nice thing is that the result on the right has the same um, shape as the, 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 the query. You see that you have this navigation object on the data, and then you have the article object on the right in the results. And the shape is, is quite similar, and that's very nice. Makes it easy to define the shape of your JSON in the, in the query. And then the query also specifies exactly which fields you want to, to get in the result. And that's also very nice. It allows you to get a, a nice JSON with a nice shape that's very uh, easy to consume then uh, downstream. So this is the, the client that we see here is GraphQL. 
it's one of the common clients that's what the one we'll use for our demo uh, GraphQL is driven by a schema. Here we see the schema in the SDLs uh, syntax, the schema description language. Uh, so it's uh, I don't want to go into details, but it's basically objects and and with you know which have fields, which have types, and the the query object is a special one defines uh, which queries you can run. So here we see a query where you can specify a section, and uh, if you want a section and a navigation. Uh, element for example the nice the interesting thing in our sample with sling is that the schema is generated dynamically using the the resource processing mechanism that i showed on the first slide uh, doing an internal sling request so you can generate specific schemas for specific resource types so kind of content object types and this gives uh, lots of uh, flexibility um, GraphQL, uh, with a GraphQL client, you can introspect the schema, and I'll, I'll just show that in the demo. You can basically, you know, see what's in the schema, which objects, which fields, and it's very interesting. And speaking of REST, discovery is an important element in REST. You know, the, the hypertext is, is meant to allow you to discover what's in your, in your data, in your content. And the GraphQL schema introspection is a very nice uh, discovery mechanism. So again, uh, already one, one parallel with REST that I think is very interesting, instead of opposing the, uh, both things. Uh, let me show you now the, the demo. So this is a, um, a Sling module that I wrote to demonstrate this Sling GraphQL core um, module that I created. So I, I, I showed you uh, quickly so that you can better understand then the, the explanation of, of how it works. So it's the demo is, is very basic websites where you have uh, news articles uh, split into different categories, music, adventure, and so on. Uh, there's lots of links. The articles have see also uh, links to other articles. So, you know, it's a pretty rich navigation. You can also navigate using tags. And all this, all what I'm showing now is server-side rendered. So I'm using GraphQL on the server side, which is also a bit unusual, but I'll explain how, why. If you look at the URL, you know, the URL says bandwidth plus protocol. It's, uh, it's you know, it's, uh, it's uh, very restful. The URL explain, you know, um, exposes what you're doing. And I think that that's nice. And there's, if you look at the articles page, there's no, I mean, th th such a simple page doesn't need to be client side rendered. It's it's very nice, I think, to to render it on the on the server side. And if we look at the source code, uh, the HTML source code of one of these pages, it's you know just very basic HTML. So uh, basic server side rendered stuff. Uh, GraphQL is invisible from the client side in this example. The uh, one of the nice things with the mechanism that we're using is that. If I replace the URL of the article instead of .html, I have .json as the extension. I get this nice JSON that's generated by the internal GraphQL query, and you get it for free, so to say. So you have the you know JSON with a navigation element similar to what we saw in the in the initial example. Then the article with its details, the text, the tags, and so on. So you get this for free based on the on how this module works, because to generate the HTML that we see here, the module makes an internal request to the .json um, URL, and and so it, you know you get both things for free, uh, even though the GraphQL query runs on the server side. Um, here we can see the, the dynamically generated schema. It's not formatted, so not very readable. But you can see excerpts which look like the GraphQL schema that I was showing. And again, it's the same URL. It's one of these article URLs with a GQL schema extension instead of uh, the, the HTML or JSON extension. So taking advantage of the Sling, um, you know, dynamic processing mechanism. The one page in our example website that's uh, client-side rendered is the search page. So if I, when I do a search here, uh, okay, it's fast, so we don't really see it here. Uh, maybe one that returns uh, more articles. Yeah, you can. Uh, you probably couldn't see that with the shared video, but it's a bit slower. So when I when I do a search, it does an actual query request to the server, 
and then I can filter out uh, categories in my articles. Here I'm clicking on the adventure, back and forth. And so it's this is this filtering happens on the client side. So I think for such a search such research page, it's good to have the client side rendering because it's a more dynamic page than the others. If we look at the, the page source code, uh, you see here that the GraphQL query is executed by making a post request to the to the server and getting the JSON that's then formatted. So that's about this this sample. It doesn't do much more than that. It's a simple thing just to demonstrate the the module. So uh, here we see uh, you know kind of a summary of what I showed. So on the left side you have the, these pages which are server side rendered. I think you know for article pages they are simple. Uh, it's fast. It's good for search engine um, you know optimization. So I think it makes total sense here to run these uh, rendering server side. And as I said, the search page is rendered client side. And also, uh, so to say, for free, uh, you get an endpoint to run GraphQL queries using the, a client such as uh, GraphQL. Um, and the nice thing here is that in both cases, server-side and client-side rendering, we use GraphQL for the queries to, uh, to aggregate our content and handlebars uh, templates for the, for the rendering. So we use the same tools either you know, uh, for the server-side or client-side rendering, which is sometimes called universal or isomorphic uh, rendering. And this is enabled by this uh, Sling uh, GraphQL core module. I'll show later uh, how it, how it, what's the internal structure of this module is. So the client-side query, uh, yeah, it's not rocket science. So uh, as we saw in the, the JavaScript code, it does a post uh, request to the GraphQL servlet. You can do either a post or a get, but if you do a get, the queries can get big and you might get go over the limitations of the of the URL size with, with a get uh, request. Sometimes, you know, the, the proxies or the caches or the servlet engines will, will cut the request or reject it if it's too large. So with a post, you don't have this problem. And then you get the JSON results and you format them with a handlebars template. So very basic, I would say, this is the usual way of using GraphQL uh, with a, with a client-side query. This is how the server-side query and rendering works. It's a bit more involved, but uh, it, it's also more flexible in a way. So the, the get request goes to, to Sling. Uh, the, the Sling scripts resolver looks for a script that matches the, the incoming, re, uh, the resource that's been matched by the request. This points to a .hbs script, which is a, uh, declared to, to be, can be usable by the handlebar script engine that I wrote using the hand, uh, handlebars library. I didn't write much code, but I set up this engine, the script engine for Sling. And as I said, this script engine does an internal request to Sling with the same path with .json. So it uses the JSON that we saw as input for the templating uh, step. And if this internal JSON request is configured to use, uh, you know, if it maps to a .gql script, then it calls my GraphQL script engine, which runs the GraphQL query uh, server side. And this talks to the Sling content repository to get the content, returns it as JSON. The handlebar script engine uses the JSON to produce whatever, you know, the HTML, uh, whatever rendering you want to create for the uh, for the output. So it's a, a bit of an inception with these three requests in the end, the external request to .html, which makes an internal request to .json to get the, the data. And this calls, makes an internal request to the GraphQL script engine to aggregate this data. So it can feel a bit complicated, but it's extremely flexible because at each step you can have different scripts, which depend on the resource types, the content object types you're getting, and, and do different things, even have different GraphQL schemas depending on which request, which uh, resource you're talking to. And this is, uh, you know, this shows the flexibility of, of Sling. Uh, a few words on how this uh, this GraphQL core works internally. So as a so Sling um, Apache Sling supports uh, multiple script engines. 
uh, as as long as they conform to the JSR, I forgot the number. There's a there's a JSR spec that defines how the API to a script engine and Sling can use any script engine that that um, you know follows this API spec. So we have uh, out of the box we have script engines for uh, JSP server side JavaScript, uh, something called HTL, which is a, a templating language that's by default. Um, you know, free free from cross site scripting problems and so on. And here I wrote uh, this this GraphQL uh, uh, script engine in the GraphQL core module, so which interprets the GraphQL query language and uses uh, GQL script extensions. So when when Sling wants to process a resource and it finds a script that's .gql, then it will call this uh, script engine and run a a GraphQL query server side. Then we also have a GraphQL servlet, which is used as the endpoint for client side GraphQL queries, uses the same modules internally, but kind of, you know, just a different facade on this. And then you have the API that you can use to uh, implement your GraphQL queries on the, on the server side. And uh, the, the most important, I mean, the, the API that you will use the most is the Sling Data Fetcher, what is called the resolver in some other GraphQL frameworks, uh, which is the, the the services that actually uh, retrieve the data. So this is a bit, you know, the the shape of this uh, Sling GraphQL core module. Uh, the schema provider it's an OSGI service, so you could define your own way to to provide schemas if you want. The default one, as I said, makes an internal request with a .gql schema extension on the same resource that you're processing. And this is what allows you to have different schemas depending on the on the resource that you're addressing. So if you do a request like that uh, with the path that we, we see here in my sample, you, you'll get the schema like this. And uh, and this, uses, this has the full power of the Sling rendering pipeline to generate these schemas. We're using uh, the at fetcher thing here that's called a directive in a GraphQL schema. And this allows, you know, you can um, define your, your own handling of these directives. So here, this is used to point to a, a no SGI service, which is a Sling data fetcher, which will be used to get the data for this, uh, for this a field of the query here. Uh, here's what it uh, how it looks like. So this is the uh, the Sling Data Fetcher uh, API. It's very simple. It has just one method. It it you know wants to get the current object or list of objects uh, based on the Sling Data Fetcher environments, which can provide the query argu arguments and the, those kind of things. And what it does here that that's a very simple example here. You can return either a map of name value or a POJO that that the GraphQL uh, framework will interpret and return to the output uh, as JSON. So here in the Java example, I'm just building a simple map with, with a few values. And you can also uh, implement these Sling Data Fetcher services as scripts uh, using any any language that's, that's supported by your Sling instance, as I mentioned, with these pluggable script engines. So here we have an example in JavaScript, very simple of how you you return the data and these are the services that implement the actual data fetching so that's you know that's where performance happens we'll see that in a in a later slide uh, that's this slide with it we are there already so the you know when we speak about the graphql people often ask uh isn't that going to be slow you know you have these very open queries what are, aren't clients going to do uh, crazy things with them of course, clients will be doing crazy things. Clients often always do that. Uh, so, how do you, you know, guard your your server around, uh, you know, against uh, denial of service and performance problems? Uh, so, this this uh, diagram here explains how it works. So, the Sling GraphQL core, this module that I, I'm speaking about, does the request handling, the schema acquisition, uh, but it doesn't do the queries by itself. It calls the GraphQL Java library that we're using to implement this module. And even GraphQL Java doesn't run the queries by itself. It calls these Sling data fetcher services to do the actual uh, data fetching, uh, aggregation, processing, and so on. So really, the performance happens here in these services. And when you, you, when you write these services, you have to be very careful uh, 
you know, so that they are performant, they maybe put limits so they can't be abused, um, and so on. So, you know, if someone's asking, isn't this going to be slow? I would say, well, it depends on your data fetch or services. Uh, and it's probably a good idea to profile them if you need to do performance analysis. So it really it really happens here. And these usually talk to the Sling content repository, which is pretty efficient because if it's configured well, the, the, the key data ends in memory. So it's it's very fast. But they can talk to any other data source. You can use this you know, to integrate with external services or synthetic generated data, whatever you want. It's all very flexible. So these data fetcher services are just OSGI services, which are quite easy to register in Sling with a few annotations. Uh, so it's all, all quite dynamic. And they are selected based on these at fetcher annotations that we saw uh, before. Caching is, uh, to me, caching is a, is a bit uh, of a problem in GraphQL. I'm not sure if it was part of the original design. Um, and especially in, in the environments where, where I'm working, where we're doing, you know, large scale uh, web content management and, and publishing systems, uh, we have HTTP caches always. And they're there, they're ready. We use CDNs, content distribution networks, or front end caches, or anything. So it's good to be able to optimize GraphQL, the GraphQL queries, to use these HTTP caches. Of course, we could create our own caching on the server side, but it's, you know, uh, if we already have caches, we'd like to use them. So we designed the mechanism in this GraphQL core that's similar to what the Apollo library is doing. The problem is that because you need to use post to do GraphQL queries, uh, as mentioned, because as with a get query, the, query the, the URLs might get too big and, and hit limits. So um, what we're doing here is that we post the query text in advance. It's a kind of a prepared query. And then uh, the, the, the Sling GraphQL servlet caches the query text, returns a 201 created status, HTTP status, with a URL, that with a path that tells you where you can execute your query. And then you can do a get on this URL, and the result of that is cacheable in an HTTP cache. So we get a 200 OK, hopefully, uh, response. And the, um, uh, you know, and with, with HTTP headers, that enables this to be cached in a front-end cache. So if you assume that many clients will be doing the same queries, which I suppose will be the case in many applications, uh, this hash that we, okay, here it's only a partial hash, this BC6F, it's computed, it's a hash, uh, I think it's a SHA-256, but it's documented. It's a, it's, a, it's a digest of the query text. So if you if you think you're lucky, you could pre-compute that, try a get be, in, uh, without doing the post. And if you're lucky, the, the query is already cached and you will get the result from the HTTP cache. So, you know, much more performant than executing the query. And if you're unlucky, then you have to do the post to, to post your query text. Uh, so uh, we think this, this can be a good way of handling this uh, this caching without us having to, to write caches or you know to operate caches which we we like to avoid. This is still evolving. Where you know this GraphQL uh, core module in Sling is pretty new, so this this might still evolve, but it looks looks quite good so far. And now <laughs> this the story about GraphQL and REST. So uh, I think you know it's uh, first when people speak about REST. You know, what is REST exactly, or what is the kind of REST that you're talking about? Uh, Roy Fielding, the inventor of REST, is one of my colleagues. He's a senior principal scientist at Adobe. Uh, so I've been, you know, uh, talk with him uh, from time to time about this. And um, yeah, I think there's lots of misconceptions around REST. And, and comparing REST to GraphQL does not make any sense, basically. Uh, Phil Sturgeon uh, agrees on that. When he says, you know, uh, the falsehood that you must pick one between GraphQL and REST, it, it, yeah, it's a falsehood. It, it doesn't make sense. GraphQL is a query and manipulate data manipulation language. REST is a software architectural style. You can't really compare one to the other. They are very different uh, concepts. Uh, so of course, when people say GraphQL versus REST, they usually mean GraphQL versus 
you know, HTTP APIs that uh, where the keywords are in the URLs or in the path. So kind of a very simplified view on REST, I think. Uh, REST, you know, if you have a truly REST system, it's, it's, it's uh, much richer than that. So as I showed, um, I think GraphQL also makes sense on the server side. And this is a nice way to have systems that are restful, you know, that are cacheable, that have hypertext, that are discoverable, uh, and and then GraphQL on the on the client side can be can be very nice as well. If you know, if you need the flexibility, and if you find a way to use the HTTP caches, if you're doing web web systems, so I really think um, a combination of these and maybe RPC as well depending on what you're doing. I really think a combination of these makes sense uh, because we, we do need queries. GraphQL is great for that. We also need caching, hypertext, scalability, and here a more HTTP-driven view might be better. So I really think we need to find the nice, you know, the right way to combine these things. And I think GraphQL is certainly better than a badly designed so-called REST API. You know, Sometimes you see URLs which have slash REST written up a case in, in the path. And, you know, maybe the people can say, oh, that's my REST URL. Of course, there's REST in the path. Doesn't make it RESTful or, or you know, doesn't mean it, it, it abides by the REST uh, principles. So really, I think, um, yeah, there's space for both styles and the combination can be very efficient. And something that I forgot to mention, let me go back to the, to the Sling uh, data fetcher slide. Oh, wait, I'm going in the wrong direction here. Uh, and one thing that I forgot to mention in this slide is that the Sling data fetchers, when you're creating this or when you're creating the, the GraphQL schema, you're really writing an API. You're writing an API of how you can access your data, what the data looks like, and this is an API. So even if the GraphQL query API by itself is very simple, post request get JSON, Internally, you you are defining an API. You need to be very careful about how you how you do that. So I think you know there's no silver bullet, and it, it, doing GraphQL right will take uh, also uh, serious efforts. So that's it. Um, in conclusion, I think GraphQL is a very nice query language that looks useful to me both on the client side and on the server side. And with this link module, we we, sh we you know we demonstrate how you can run it on the server side, and it, I think we demonstrate that it's cool. And and especially if you can run the GraphQL queries either on the server side or client side, you can use the same tool, decide where it runs best. And I think that's a, that's a great way of using it. Uh, and as we said, it's not better or worse than REST. It's different animals, and I think they can play play well together. And okay, this is more Sling specific, but I think the the the, the prototype, the sample website, demonstrate that internal Sling requests are, are very useful when you have this, this you know this chain of internal requests, which in the end provide uh, the the HTML content. So um, this, if you're if you're interested or involved in Sling, the Sling GraphQL core is pretty new. Uh, we're just releasing version 006 these days, so uh, it can certainly be improved. And as usual, patches are welcome. Uh, so you have links here. I'll publish the the your the slides as well. Uh, I'll, I'll you know announce on Twitter when that happens, and. Uh, also, you have a link to this fake content generator. The, the text in my sample website is generated by this thing. It's a pretty useful tool to generate content that's a bit more uh, uh, specific than Lorem Ipsum. And, and still, uh, you know, you can generate lots of contents uh, pretty easily. So that's it for this uh, presentation. Um, I, let's see if we have any questions. You're welcome to, to you know, write them in the chat. And I'm, I'll be happy to to answer them. If not, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I hope this uh, this has been useful for you. You're welcome.
So I forgot to mention, of course, the, the you know all the source code. It's all open source. So uh, maybe uh, let me put a link here to my Twitter, so you can. Because my name is not the easiest one to write and pronounce, but so you can watch that for the link to the to the slides very soon. So it doesn't seem to have to be questions, but thank you very much for being here. And the next session will be starting very soon, I think at yeah, in a few minutes.